Adam Taxon here with Dave Ehrenberg, the elected state attorney for Palm Beach County, Florida, and a friend from our undergraduate days at Harvard. Dave has been on with me numerous times through the years, more often about football than about his actual uh, work, which is, which is impressive. Dave is always very informative and entertaining, which is why I keep having him on, and because we are a few hours from Super Bowl 48 in East Rutherford, New Jersey, between the Broncos and the Seahawks, it's a good time to discuss with Dave the current state of the league. Oh, and I should mention, Dave Ehrenberg is a lot uh, more disinterested than the others, who are generally from the sports media or the actual NFL, the others who are giving state of the NFL commentary right around now. Dave, uh, thanks for joining me for what will inevitably be a pretty open-ended discussion, as all of ours tend to be. First, uh, your general thoughts on the NFL season, which is about to wrap up, and also where the league finds itself. And you might want to mention uh, some things from the vantage point of your considerable past experience working as a lawyer in the area of uh, consumer protection. So the floor is yours, Dave. Well, it's great to be back on, Adam, and uh, happy Super Bowl day. And I say that as uh, part of fair use in a non-commercial way because I don't want the NFL to sue me for using the name Super Bowl. I was driving by a uh, sports bar the other day and it had, watch the big game here. Well, you know why they have to write that. They can't write Super Bowl because it's a trademark name and the, Super Bowl, the NFL could instigate a legal action if you are using the term Super Bowl and you don't have a license. Uh, of course, since you're a news uh, agency, I guess, or a uh, you're using it as fair use, you're not using it for commercial purpose. So, there's my little legal lesson of the day, and, and uh, I'm looking forward to tonight's game. I think this year was uh, a big year for the NFL. They did see uh, the, uh, their revenues continue to rise, although attendance has sort of seemed to uh, level off, and I think a lot of that is because games are so expensive, and the alternatives are so much better these days. You don't have to watch the NFL with rabbit ears anymore. You can watch it on HD TV with no line for the bathroom, with beers that are, are pennies on the dollar which you'd pay for in the stadium, and uh, we don't have to worry about the uh, weather elements. So I think uh, the NFL has done a great job keeping people in the stadiums despite all the competition, and this game is always sold out except the weather really, and they'll never admit it, but the weather uh, has undermined the profitability of the game as seen at, uh, through the uh, number of unsold tickets. Uh, and then finally, what's interesting is, from what I've been hearing, is that normally when there's a, an NFL Super Bowl at a, uh, in, a, uh, in a city like Indianapolis or anywhere else, even Miami, I can experience that firsthand, the NFL takes over the city. But New York has swallowed up the Super Bowl. It's such a, New York is, is such a huge town with so many things going on that even the Super Bowl has not dominated New York City. You don't walk around the streets seeing people in, in Broncos or or Seahawks uh, colors, you see people doing what they always do in New York this time of year. It just happens to be yet one other event going on in the city, and uh, even though it is in New Jersey. And so uh, overall, I think the NFL is strong. I think that it could be uh, better. Um, I think the greatest challenge in the NFL is the uh, the uh, brain injury, CT, concussion lawsuit that the judge recently rejected the uh, settlement for, and that to me is the greatest challenge. But other than that, I think Fine. Yeah, well, I mean, let me just touch on the uh, unsold playoff tickets. Now, it was extremely cold. Philadelphia sold out, but I don't think Philadelphia was uh, as cold. Uh, wild card weekend, it was, they had trouble selling out the tickets in Green Bay, Cincinnati, and what was the other wild card city? I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, but they had some trouble uh, selling out. But you seem to think it's just the weather and also the fact that those teams had been in the playoffs for several years, so Wild Card Weekend, with the exception of Philadelphia, that uh, Wild Card Weekend wasn't that big a deal. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. You know, it just, and also the alternatives, you know. It, it, TV has gotten so good, the coverage has gotten so good with the technology and the HDTV and, and being able to watch it anywhere on your phone, in fact, that... Well, there's a lot of alternatives. You know, you can uh, go out golfing and watch the game. You know, you you can uh, you you can watch it from the best seat in the house, which really is in your living room. And it's it's tough uh, unless you're really motivated and you have that money. If you have money, it's tough to really to, to go to these games uh, because they are expensive. Parking is a mess. The uh, the commute is always uh, difficult and. If you want to bring your family, I mean, my gosh, so expensive. Uh, and then, you know, you don't want to also have to deal with drunk, unruly fans mm -hmm. that are 
ruining your your night and uh, day there and threatening you and your children. So uh, these are the type of things the NFL have to deal with, and, uh, and that's one reason why now they have more Wi-Fi in the stadiums, and that's why uh, they have instant replay reviews on the big screen. They used to not let you see what the referees were looking at on instant replay. They didn't want to embarrass the refs, but now they have to because you know every time they don't show something, the TV at home, the viewers at home watch it. And uh, that's another advantage of watching it at home. So the NFL's trying to compete with their own uh, TV markets, you know, with their own TV stations. And, uh, and uh, the fact that the tennis at least is stabilized shows that they're doing okay at it. And uh, NFL's still the number one sport. I think that's not the greatest challenge. The greatest challenge is the concussion issue, not the challenge of TV. Yeah, let's talk about that. Joe Namath had some commentary about that, that the human body was just not meant to play... Uh, football as it is played today, and he's talking that a lot of the defensive players were a lot smaller when he played, though he had injury problems himself, which curtailed his career somewhat. And uh, sort of a contrast to that is a famous constituent of yours in Palm Beach County, Rush Limbaugh, has been decrying what he calls the wussification of the game a lot this year. He says, you know, for, for one thing, he's not convinced that the concussions have been proven by, the brain trauma has been proven by science, but that's another matter. But whether it's unavoidable or not, that the lack of being able to hit people the way you used to uh, just makes it not a, as exciting a game. He calls it, again, wussification. I wanted to know what you no, thought of this. No, he's not the one with early onset Alzheimer's. Yeah. Right. It, to me, it's yeah, it's easy for him to say, but you, know, you have people who really are uh, dying of a younger age. I mean, look, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, you have uh, a junior say out to... Uh, uh, I'm, 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 I'm blanking on the uh, center for the, uh, for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, Mike gosh. Webster, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah uh, Webster, sorry. Webster, yeah. Um, you know, you have these guys who were long-time NFL uh, studs who became, uh, and, you know, you have the, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, even I, you know, the, uh, the, the guy from Chicago, the, uh, the defensive back who committed suicide. Dave Dwerson, was that? Uh, Dorson. Yeah. Dorson. Yeah, there you go. I mean, the, the problem is, you know, you got, this is real. TV is real. And the NFL has, uh, was skeptical of it for years. And then, through the efforts of Chris Nowitzki and others to try to bring this to the forefront, they finally compelled the NFL to sit at the table with them. And then the NFL uh, reached a settlement agreement, which was thrown out by the judge because it looks like it's uh, too low. And uh, they're going to have to negotiate again. And I really think that this is real. This is not just, oh, you know, this is the game we always knew, and now they're, it's just our new self-esteem movement where, you know, we're telling everyone to wear ballet slippers. No, this is real. People are dying, and something had to be done. And if, if nothing else, then for the future of the NFL, because uh, if you want the NFL to continue as a viable entity, you can't have four players dying of early onset Alzheimer's. True. Yeah, I mean, I just, you know, it compromises the game somewhat. I don't know what the answer is, but I thought you might have some thoughts on, thoughts on that. Now, you're in South Florida, and you're a diehard Dolphins fan, and the Dolphins are really are almost never in the news uh, in recent years for their play, unless it's for extremely bad play, which was the case in uh, 2007. Was 2007 or 2006? 2007. Uh, Is that Pennington year? No, I'm talking the year they were almost 0-16. They were one lucky pass oh, away. Oh, when they beat Baltimore in overtime, yeah. they were 1-15. Yeah, um, but yeah, I believe it was 2009. they were in the news. Uh, no, that was 2006, uh, or was it 2009? No, maybe you're right. It was 2009. Uh, I don't remember. No, no, no. It was the year before the Patriots went undefeated. 2006. It was the same year the Patriots. Yeah, went 2007. The Sorry, maybe. sorry that you had to listen to this. Whoever's listening, uh, but they were in the news <laughs> quite a bit uh, this year uh, with the Rich Richie Incognito and Jonathan Martin. Uh, situation and you had some pretty harsh words for uh, Martin in particular and there were some new revelations this week which I guess are confirming of the general opinion you had and I'm just wondering what, if you could talk about that a little bit. Well it's not a surprise to me that you saw that it wasn't reported early on that there was a back and forth, back and forth about drugs, back and forth about a lot of uh, things that sort of cast a shadow on the, uh, the belief that John Martin was some you know, innocent bullied victim. It turned out that it was a lot more of a two-way street here. 
And so I'm not surprised by that because that's why John Lamar didn't get a lot of sympathy here in, in South Florida. Uh, in, in speaking to people, I I thought there were more people on incognito side than John Lamar, and certainly his teammates were all on incognito side to a person. And that's also the African American players too. Uh, we're all with incognito, and so that to me showed that that the media there was a disconnect between the media reports and what was really going on. And to me, it looked like it was back and forth. It not pleasant language, but you, know, you have uh, locker room stuff that goes on in I would say every other locker room. And so to pretend that the Dolphin locker room is somehow so much worse than everywhere else is a joke. It's it's ridiculous, and that's why you don't see other players speaking out on this. You see. Former players or former, you know, that it used to be Tony Dundee speaking out and others, but but but, but you don't see current players because they know that this kind of stuff goes on all the time. And so I am not, uh, I, I'm not one to to start uh, jumping ahead of the curb and saying that Jonathan Martin is is a saint and is a victim and he will be uh, welcome back in open arms. No, he's not going to be a Miami Dolphin again, and he may never even play in the NFL again because. Uh, other NFL teams, do you want this sideshow? If you were a good player, I guess you could accommodate it. But he wasn't a good player. He was not a good player. And you see that he's someone that other players are not going to trust fully. Is he going to secretly record their conversations? Is he going to save text messages and then bring them out to the lawyers or to the media uh, when it's convenient for him? So why would you want to bring him back? So yeah, I, look, I, I, I'm not here to say Rishi and Kanye of the state, far from it. I, but I do think it was a two-way street. And I think the media has overlooked that until now. I think one good lesson is that you can't always trust the national media to cover stories like this about a local team. And this was the case often. So many people are surprised by how disliked Donovan McNabb was in Philadelphia. You know, because the national media always portrayed him as a great guy. But he was really quite disliked by just about everyone in Philadelphia after a while. And it sounds like it's a somewhat similar situation there. Um... I like the money. It's always Tony in Philadelphia. Did you see his portrayal? <laughs> no, I never watched the show once in my life. I've never watched it. Uh, what, what is it? It's the greatest show uh, on TV, in my opinion. But uh, they had a they the uh, the guys went to a football fantasy camp and uh, were supposed to meet the great Donovan McNabb. Uh, and all they did was have this. Uh, they had an African American actor, like some 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 chubby African American guy, show up. Uh, pretending to be a Donovan McNabb saying alright work hard everyone <laughs> I realized what and uh, so yeah it's just to me it's very funny uh, so he, <laughs> he was treated as a big celebrity in the show at least yeah, oh, he's a big celebrity. It's just he wasn't particularly well liked, and uh, in large part because of what happened at the Super Bowl uh, nine years ago, right around now. But uh, you know, it was interesting that they had to uh, bring Brian Dawkins out when they honored him. Brian Dawkins introduced him to basically make him uh, boo-proof. If you hadn't brought Dawkins out there, there was no way people would boo and they would cheer. So it's a little that's, true. That happens a lot in the world of pro wrestling. You you match someone up that's that's not over with the fans with someone who is over with the fans and I'll you know, try to translate that popularity to the other person. Yeah, and they do that with politicians too at games often. Um, in, in fact, pro wrestling, you know, my view is that it's about as real as the breasts of uh, Wendy Davis, but uh, you had something you wanted to say about something that happened in WWE, which I know nothing about, but you wanted to mention it, and uh, here's your forum to do so. Well, well if, if there are WWE fans out there, and I know they are, they probably, though, know, uh, uh, they don't want to admit it, but, you know, the fact that CM Punk, who is the, the people's champion, the guy who, uh, the real people's champion, the, the voice of the people, uh, who uh, always has a antagonistic relationship with his bosses at the WWE, the McMahons, uh, looked like he's had enough and, and quit the company. And so uh, it's a big deal for all wrestling fans who, you know, that's that's the guy we, we, uh, we, we like the most and we thought spoke for all the disenchanted wrestling fans out there who don't get what they want. And uh, now he's had enough and has quit the company. And I was at a live event a couple nights ago. And throughout the live event, there were long and loud chants for CM Punk. And that was another version of protest. That was, of course, the chants were not recognized by the ring announcer or, uh, I'm sure, by the WWE officials. Uh, because, you know, they're just going to move on. They took CM Punk off their website, off all their promo uh, materials, and they're going to move on like he's never existed. So, 
just something that's going on in the in the real world of pro wrestling. Before I get to uh, uh, two Dolphins related questions and then finally a Super Bowl prediction from you, uh, the Hall of Fame uh, selections were just announced. They were Michael Strahan, Andre Reid, Walter Jones, Derek Brooks, Aeneas Williams, Claude Humphrey, and Ray Guy. And significant names who did not get in were Tony Dungy, uh, which I, you know, I question whether he was ever that good a coach or he had good coordinators and uh, Peyton Manning with him. Uh, Morton Anderson, Jerome Bettis, Tim Brown, Eddie DeBartolo, Kevin Green, Charles Haley, John Lynch, and Will, Will Shields did not make it. What do you think, think of those selections? I think they're the right selections. Uh, you know, uh, by the way, Kevin Green was involved with uh, pro wrestling WCW, and uh, at least his performance as a pro wrestler maybe should disqualify him for further <laughs> consideration. He was terrible. Not as bad as Steve Mongo McMichael, by the way, who had the worst crossover uh, from pro wrestling to, uh, excuse me, from uh, pro football to pro wrestling. Uh, probably the worst crossover star ever. Uh, but as far as the uh, the uh, the winner, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm glad the right guy got in. You know, I mean, just because the punter doesn't mean he shouldn't be out. He's, he he uh, shouldn't be in. He's probably probably the greatest punter of all time. And uh, someone as a kid growing up knew that he could change games, and you don't see many punters being able to do that. Uh, and uh, back in the day, I think is he the first punter ever to be inducted? I think he is. Remember, um, yeah. what's his name? The guy who was on Minnesota, the controversial guy, Chris Cluey. One of his issues was that that Ray Guy should be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Um, well, I think that was a good choice. Yeah, it's about time, probably. And, and, uh, and, and, and as far as the other mentions, who, who are the other mentions who uh, were inducted? Michael Strahan, who Warren Sapp had well, said should not Strahan, be in there. And then the Warren Sapp battle is really interesting. Um, Warren Sapp is right on one thing. i got to say this about uh, Strahan. I've met Strahan. He seems like a nice enough guy. I only met him briefly. But the, the thing is, is that his stack record will always be tainted. It will. It's just a fact. Because Brett Favre laid down for him. Brett Favre gave him that sack record because that's his friend, and he laid down. And you watch that video, and there is no doubt in anyone's mind. And uh, for that reason, his sack record will always be tainted. And, you know, I think that's bad enough that Brett Favre laid down for him. But then Strahan act, act, acted afterwards like he really had accomplished a sack record. He was in tears and he was jumping around and it was uh, you know the whole moment was totally destroyed by the fact that it was a hollow sack a hollow victory and now a hollow record and Strahan might well have sacked him or have gotten another sack in that game uh, anyway and gotten the exactly. right legitimately Favre did him no favors you know he tried to help a friend out he did him no favors and everyone knows it was a lay down and that really hurt the integrity of the game that's like uh when uh, in women's basketball, college basketball, I, remember, I guess it was Dave Gavin who did this, who allowed this to happen. Although, if, if it weren't Dave, I, I, I apologize. But it was when uh, there was a woman who was injured and had to get the record. She was two points away from the uh, from the all-time scoring record, and uh, she she uh, she was injured and could not play. And so the the uh, the teams uh, were all on the sidelines, and they each team. Uh, they allowed the injured player to come onto the court by herself and score a regulation basket to set the record. Yeah. And then, in return, the other team got a free basket, too. And to me, that was one of the biggest disgraces in college sports that I ever seen. Yeah, that uh, sounds that way. Well, it's, it's almost like Peyton Manning's uh, passing record this year. I don't know if you remember, uh, but there was a pass, a seven-yard pass, which gave him the single-season passing yardage record over Drew Brees. Uh, which really was, or there was a pass earlier in the game that enabled him to break the record when he did, uh, that really was a lateral, but they gave it to him anyway because he came out of the game in the second half thinking that he had the record. He would have inevitably broken it anyhow, but it's a little bit fuzzy there. Well, that sounds pretty shady in itself, but, you know, it's not like they stopped the game and right. the other team laid down while he got the passing record. So I would say that the college example is still worse, but yeah, I, like if that's what happened with Peyton Manning, then yeah, shame, that's not right. Yeah, you can't play Manning, obviously. Uh, no, no, but this is just all the process. And speaking of Manning, to shift to another thing where I know you have a bias, being a huge Miami Dolphins fan, but if the Broncos win tonight, the uh, it's a pretty strong case for Manning being the greatest quarterback of all time. Uh, yeah, I and uh, what do you think of that? I mean, where does Marino compare? Obviously, he doesn't have the postseason record, even that Manning does. But 
Well, I mean, look, I'm a huge Dan Marino fan, but I realize that he didn't win the Super Bowl, even though he didn't play with good defenses. He didn't play with any running game. And, you know, he was a one-man band for a while, although he did have a great coach, of course. Uh, I think that you can definitely make the argument that Peyton Manning is the greatest of all time if he wins the Super Bowl today. Tom Brady had three out of five Super Bowls. Uh, but uh, Peyton Manning will be comparable if he wins today. And he also had that big win over Manning, to, excuse me, uh, over uh, Brady to get into the Super Bowl. Although I do think Brady wasn't himself. I think he was missing passes. I think he felt the, uh, the, the sickness that he had from the uh, days before. I think that it carried over into that game because he wasn't, he wasn't right. Uh, but, yeah, I think Manning deserves this, too. I like him a lot. And, by the way, I think he, he's sort of a conservative is what I hear. Is that right? Is he one of you? I, I honestly don't know about his politics one time. In fact, uh, I had heard that a little bit about Brady er, earlier in his career. And, in fact, I was once on the air with Rush Limbaugh about that issue. It's funny and it's a digression, so I won't talk about it here. But I don't know. My guess is Russell Wilson certainly is, uh, given his uh, pretty strong Christian beliefs. But I really don't know much about Manning's uh, politics. I imagine he keeps it to himself and really doesn't think about a whole lot other than football. But You know, although the people listening to this will be uh, listening to this after the game is over, and I'll... Not know, necessarily. I'll like to make a prediction when, you know, this will be listened to after everyone knows the, uh, the score. But I do think Denver's going to win. And I think Denver's going to win because... I still have a hard time imagining that Peyton Manning, the great Peyton Manning, who's a first ballot Hall of Famer, possibly the greatest quarterback of all time, is going to lose to second year man Russell Wilson. And no disrespect to Russell Wilson, who is a good quarterback, but he's no Peyton Manning. Yeah. So we'll see. Well, he's not going to lose to Russell Wilson. He'll lose to the number one defense in the NFL. In fact, I will go on record and say the Seahawks will win 31 14. So, uh, you care okay. to give a score? Well, you know my record so far in predictions, right? You asked me who was going to be in the Super Bowl. Got that right. Nailed it. Yeah. First time two number ones in a long time, so it's not as obvious as it might seem. But, uh, right. yeah. congrats well, on that. Very few people, I think, pick Seattle over San Francisco. Um, I don't know. They're pretty tough at home. They are. You know, people may listen to this because I'm going to get this up online a few hours before the game actually starts, and, you know, not everyone's going to watch the. Uh, Barack Obama interview or all the uh, pregame hype. We're going to actually watch a gra uh, Groundhog Day uh, in a few hours because my wife's only seen it once and uh, my 14 year old stepson has never seen it and it's appropriate day I think to see it obviously being February 2nd. You know let me ask one more substantive question. Uh, if you care to give a score for the Super Bowl that's fine too but you did mention to me privately that part of the problem with the Dolphins is the problem that the Cowboys and the Redskins have that they're being compromised by really bad ownership. And uh, if you're willing to say anything more about that. You know, the owner, uh, Steve Ross, I've met him, I've sat in the skybox, he's a nice man and a smart guy. What happens, though, is that you have a lot of successful business people who don't translate into football. And whatever, it's an interesting phenomenon. I'd love to see something written about it. Why can't successful businessmen, or successful at everything else in business, in their lives, why do they have trouble being successful in the world of sports. And it's not just Steve Ross, it's Daniel Snyder, uh, Jerry Jones, and yes, I know he's got a Super Bowl, but come on, that was uh, that was uh, Jimmy Johnson and, uh, and the great uh, Herschel Walker trade, and then after that, uh, he hasn't sniffed a Super Bowl since then. Since and he the, wasn't uh, in, as involved the with Jones the team then. You know, uh, since then, they've gone downhill longer than Jerry Jones has been. He wasn't the general manager then. Yeah, uh, but he, Jerry Jones didn't pull off the Herschel Walker trade. Right, right, right. That wasn't, that, that, that wasn't he who made that, who, who, uh, who created that trade. Uh, that was, actually, if you want to give credit for that trade, it was Mike Lynn, the general manager of Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> He's the one that made that trade. But uh, as far as uh, owners, you see all these successful businessmen who just can't get out of their own way. And we'll see if Steve Ross is in that category. I know he wants to win, but, you know, he's, the decision, he's very loyal. And that loyalty has, hurt the team because he stuck with Jeff Ireland for years after others would have dispatched him. Uh, and he he's sticking with Joe Philbin and because of that, he didn't want to give the new general manager the power to fire the coach. And that's why they had to go to their like sixth or seventh choice and general managers, the guy from Tampa Bay, a hickey who, you know, was about to be fired by Tampa Bay. Mm -hmm. And the Dolphins hired him. Getting promotion, hired him as a general manager. 
Yeah, and you know, it's funny. The Dolphins sh- of all teams should not have as much of a problem because Miami's a fairly pleasant place to live, especially in the winter, fall and winter months when football largely takes place. Obviously, it's a full-time job. But, you know, obviously there are some exceptions. Robert Kraft would probably be the consensus favorite uh, if you asked who the best owner in the NFL is, and he's obviously self-made. But you see a lot of people who are considered really good owners who really didn't make their money themselves. They happy, happened to inherit it, and I'm talking about Jeff Lurie of the Philadelphia Eagles, but also uh, just the families, the Mara family and the um, Rooney family in Pittsburgh. I mean, they're inherited through the generations, but they're no real self-made people running them now. Yeah, the Rooney family has developed a culture that's been so successful, and it's something that everyone can try to emulate, but it's, you know, they, 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 don't, they don't overpay for free agents. They're the anti-Dan Snyders. Right. You know? And whatever it is, their structure, they're, they're willing to take a chance on a coach. I mean, they're one of the first to hire an African-American coach, a young guy who came out of nowhere, and look what he's, he's done a really good job there, Mike Tomlin. Yeah. And, you know, I just, I, I think that whatever they're doing, they're doing right. And we can look at it as far as their, uh, maybe it's because they don't overpay, maybe it's because they, uh, they're willing to take risks uh, and chances with coaches and, and players. I don't know. Whatever it is, they, they've, uh, they've done everything right, it seems like. And also, they come from a town where it's, it's not a glamour town. Pittsburgh is great. It's a hard work and steel town, but it's not like South Beach. And yet, they're able to attract uh, players, coaches, and have a franchise that everyone can be proud of, as opposed to my hometown franchise, which hasn't had a winning season in years. Mm-hmm. No doubt, no doubt. And, and to be fair, Paul Allen, <laughs> coach of the Seattle Seahawks playing in the Super Bowl, has had a pretty good business career himself. But anyhow, okay, Dave... Just because you're a big, uh, successful businessman doesn't mean you're going to be a failure. Right, right, that, right. It's interesting that people who have never failed in anything in their life seem, they can't seem to get out of their own way when it comes to owning a professional football team. Well, it seems like the connection between Jones and uh, Snyder and perhaps Stephen Ross, whom I don't know that much about, is one that a lot of successful business people have, but there's a lot of arrogance there, and that can sometimes uh, translate to uh, thinking you know a lot more about football than you actually do. Yeah, I think that's true. Plus, some of the characteristics that succeed and help you in your own business, like loyalty, for example, but really uh, doesn't do much for you in the NFL, which is, what have you done for me lately? You know, it's a win now league. It's a week to week league. And if you're, lo- you know, build loyalty from within, that is not necessarily a great uh, characteristic for NFL success. You need to be ready to make changes. You know, you've got to be ready to fire coordinators and fire coaches and, and change around the players because there's always a team. If you look at recent memory of the NFL, there's always a team that goes from the outhouse to the penthouse. Mm-hmm. This year it was Kansas City. You know, every year. There's some things you can turn around so fast in today's NFL. So shame on the Dolphins for being stuck in mediocrity for years. Right. All right, Dave, it's always a pleasure. Uh, enjoy the game tonight. Thanks, Adam. You too, my friend.